Beautiful day. We are so glad to have you all here. And for those of you joining us online and worshiping remotely, we are so glad to have you as well. For those of you here, I invite you to stand up and join with us in song.
think I'm going to have some join me, but while I've got your uh, attention, I want to share a quick story about what happened while I was at church camp with uh, a few of our little kids this week, Maggie being one of them. We sang a song during um, the gathering time, the meal time, and it was Peace Like a River, which we also sang on Camp Sunday. And they did not do it correctly, and Maggie made sure that they knew that they left out a, a verse. Because we do such a great job at letting you lead here at church, so she knew how to lead the song. And I just, I want to praise us for embracing our children in the leadership roles that they have because it allows them to be leaders at places like church camp. And that's really awesome, Maggie. Give me five. Okay, let's, let's say our children's fasting. Sophia, did you want to help too? No, thanks. Okay. <laughs> then let us say together our children's blessing. May you, May you always know, know how much God loves you and claims you. May, May you, you always know how much we love you and claim you as our own. And, and may you return to teach us about the realm of God as only children can do. All right, thank you. Good morning and welcome again. I also want to wish all those fatherly figures with us and with us in our hearts a happy Father's Day. As someone who's trying to raise a little boy, uh, I appreciate a space that's filled with people like Tommy and Jerry and Dobbs and Drexel and Albert that he has a safe place that he can come to and see amazing influences and people showing emotion and beautiful Beautiful examples of what it's like um, to be a man in 2024, so thank you. I invite you to join me in this morning's opening prayer followed by our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. God who shares everything with us, fill us with an excitement to share the good news. The good news that you love us, claim us, and call us very good. Give us the courage to introduce others to the gospel. Fill our cups today through worship and the gift of being together and being a community determined to shape our lives around your son and his teachings, including the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you at this time to check in on behalf of yourself, your families, as well as submit any prayer requests and greet your neighbor as we prepare for the rest of worship. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. You know, I remember my father and parents sitting right back in the back row. Isn't it funny how we always sit kind of in the same spot? And that's, that's where I kind of sit now. Uh, Reverend Mead has asked me to uh, chat a little bit about my father, who was involved in this church for decade after decade after decade as an, as an elder. But first, before I do that, I want to th thank the elders, this congregation, uh, Reverend Mead, Meredith, uh, and everybody else who prayed for my granddaughter, who at seven months had liver transplant, and at four, about four and a half years old, uh, her body started to reject her uh, liver and she was going to have to go through it again. But through prayer, through this congregation, through God's love, so far she has come back, and it may not have to happen at all a second time. So. 
just, just, just happened to have a picture of her and her brother. And speaking of father, her father and her mother, I mean, they are just princes. Anyway, uh, again, my father was an elder in this church, and he wrote many, many communion prayers, which were highly regarded by the congregation, and he was highly re respected. Um, most of you won't remember him because he was born in 1899. My father was born in 1899. Gosh, that makes me feel old. Anyway, he always kidded me about the only way to heaven was through First Christian Church at 4th and Breckenridge. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you all have seen it, but ever since... We've been out here on Wolfpin Branch Road. I've been thoroughly confused. I, I don't know exactly how to act or, or whatever, so I just kind of sit, sit back in, in the corner. Uh, ironically, my father's father died the year that my father was born. And his mother later remarried and my father's father was replaced by an abusive alcoholic who eventually abandoned them when my father was 15. So at 15, my father quit school to support his mother and sisters, and he went to work. And after a while, his employer decided he was too smart to be doing what he was doing and sponsored him to go back to high school. And from there, he got a scholarship to Yale and graduated Phi Beta Kappa in three years. What a life story. I mean, holy mackerel. Uh, if he watched the offering today, he would be absolutely amazed and disappointed. And do you know why he'd be disappointed? Have you ever noticed? He, doesn't re he wouldn't realize about online giving. <laughs> and when we passed the plates and stuff, I even thought maybe we ought to just put empty envelopes so if <laughs> guests come by, you know, they'd think we, we aren't so, so, so tight. Uh, anyway, uh, we are creatures of habit. And most of us give the same every week. And so I'm going to suggest how easy it would be to up that one-time number just a little bit because I think our buildings need it and it's time. And just a gift that I'm going to give you as far as I'm concerned, if you do nothing else today, go home and read The Dash by Linda Ellis. I don't know how many of you all have read that, but it is worth reading. It was a poem written in 1996. Neither my father nor my mother would have read it, but they both lived as if they knew it perfectly. Let us pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, as we meet this day, we thank Thee that Thou art indeed our Heavenly Father, who cares for us, who loves us, who gave us his only begotten Son, that we may have eternal life. Help us to be more worthy of this love and sacrifice every day of our lives upon the earth. Amen. By the way, this picture. I think it's
For all those who give thanks for the gifts that have been given this day and all throughout this week, please say amen. Amen. All right. From the Gospel of Matthew, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That feels like a really big ask from Jesus. (laughs) Like, everyone... (laughs) Obey everything, all nations. No wonder people get freaked out about evangelism, right? It sounds overwhelming. So to start off, for everybody that saw the cover of the bulletin, saw the sermon title, which is a series, so we're going to talk about it for three weeks, and you all stayed, everybody gets a gold star. (laughs) That you didn't turn around and run out the door. You get a gold star for staying. I also want to remind you of something before we get into this topic of evangelism. I want us to ground ourselves in the very first thing that God ever said to humans. You are very good. And so is everyone else. It includes you. It includes me. As Matthew Fox calls it, it is God's original blessing on humanity. And if we can remember that, if we can keep that at our core, at the most fundamental level, that in God's eyes, we are good, then you have the heart of the message of evangelism. Telling other people that God thinks they are very good too. Okay? So we're going to talk about how we're going to share that message. So this series for me is about reclaiming something that somewhere along the line we either gave it away or we ceded it to a different side or we just chose not to pick up because it's uncomfortable, we don't think we're good at it, for a variety of reasons. Uh, As one author put it, we've turned evangelism into a dirty word. So instead, we created the right programs, or we thought if we played the right music, or we offered events at the right time, that people would come, or they'd come and discover how delightful we are, which we are, and that would be enough, and they would stay. And sometimes that works, but we've sometimes misplaced the fact that those are tools to help us do evangelism. They're tools to give us opportunities in order to tell people how good God thinks they are. Sometimes we mess up and we think the tool is the evangelism. The food trucks give us the opportunity to share the good news. And we've spent the last two years creating a variety of these. Now, this hasn't been like a switch and bait. Like, no, we've offered those things because we believe community is good. We believe being good neighbors is good. That's why we should do that. So I realized in this series that in order to talk about evangelism in 2024, you have to talk, as much as you talk about what you're going to do, you have to talk about what we're not going to do as well. And so each week I've kind of got a series of those. And this week's is we are going to share, we are not going to shame. I would add, we also aren't going to guilt people. (laughs) We're also not going to tell people to come hang out with Jesus because they're afraid of what happens if they don't. So there is no room for shame or guilt or fear in our kind of evangelism. Those are not the tools we're going to pick up and use. Because I think when we think about, that's mostly what we think about when we think about evangelism is the way that we don't want to do it or the kind that is filled with shame. You know, we have the most obvious examples of, you know, the guy with the bullhorn on the corner when there's a yum event shouting about the end of the world. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be the people who are telling that God, telling people that God hates them or God's not for them. And the good news is I'm not worried about us becoming those people. That's not a worry I have. I worry about a lot of things in the church. That isn't one of them. But as I've mentioned before, I get so annoyed that they're often so loud both in the moment, but also on the news and in social media. And I also get annoyed because I believe they're so deeply wrong about Jesus. And because the message is supposed to be good news. 
Condemnation, and hate, that doesn't sound good. I don't know about you all, but that's not good news to me. I want to share good news. I believe evangelism shouldn't make people feel bad. I can't control why they come to church unless you're my daughter and she would say, because you make me every week. She's not here to say it, so I'll say it for her. Yes, she would say that, Chad, yes, yes. <laughs> she would. She said it before. But evangelism should make people feel good. But it also made me realize when I was doing this and I was feeling all righteous that I don't use that kind of bullhorn or I don't go shout things from the, sh from the streets. I realized that probably at some point, not probably, I have in my ministry used some kind of shame-based evangelism. Mine just looks a little more subtle, you know. Especially with somebody, see if you recognize this one, somebody, well, my friend Chad's here, who I worked with for 10 years. So if Chad's been gone from church for a really long time, and I come in and I say, oh, I'll have to introduce myself to you. I don't know you because you haven't been here. Oh, you must be so busy, too busy for us. Is lightning going to strike, Chad, that you're here? Probably. Where, well, I mean, <laughs> that's for a whole other set of reasons. <laughs> Where have you been? Coming back to church, especially coming on a Sunday to worship, can be such a hard barrier for people, especially if they've been gone for a really long time or if they've never come at all. We don't know why they've been gone. We don't know why they aren't here, whether it's work or illness or family issues or they got out of the habit or somebody hurt their feelings, somebody made them angry, or they went somewhere where someone made them ashamed or guilty or afraid. People bring their complex lives to worship just like us. They bring them to worship, they bring them to pickleball, they bring them to food trucks, they bring them to Bible study. They don't need to be reminded of things we think are wrong. The only thing they need in that moment is welcome, to be delighted that they took the risk, the challenge of choosing to meet us here. Chad, I'm delighted that you're here. To tell them that they do belong, to give them hope for a community that welcomes them. They want to hear that they are still very good. So that's one level of the shame that we don't want to do, but there's this other one that I think we all struggle with, and it has to do with ourselves, and that we have to get over ourselves with it, which is, and I only know this because I've now heard it from three times, Chad, the magic, three times. I've heard this from three different people saying, man, I've been coming to worship, and there's so many people here I don't know, or I don't recognize. Jenny's nodding with me. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually, that's good. That's not a bad thing. It's just a surprise. Here's the dilemma, is that's where the curiosity ends. They say that to me and then no more of the conversation. They're too ashamed to ask the names, to walk across the pew, to sit in a different pew, as Harold said, a different spot. To introduce themselves, to just admit that we don't know. Also, this is a moment I had my writing partner who suggests this to me. If you have been in the church for at least six months or maybe a year, even if you haven't joined, you're no longer new either. <laughs> it's your place as well. It's like our home. If somebody was coming in the front door and we're all the way in the back watching TV in the living room, we don't stay back there, do we? And just shout or say nothing while they come into our home. They've come into our home. We're there to welcome them, introduce ourselves if we don't know them already. And you're going to get to practice this today. I did tell Chad that I was doing this, and I would like him to admit that you all, I don't just do this here. I've always done this. Always. All, didn't come because of yeah, right. He almost didn't come because he knew I was going to make you move. But before that, before I make you move and talk to each other, as I love to do, one thing I do want to peel back is why I chose this series now. As most of you know, we started food trucks last Wednesday, which went great, by the way. This week, we've coordinated with First Kids, and they've decided to host their picnic with their families and their kiddos and line it up with our food trucks because it's such a good event. 
So they're going to be there. But we're also going to do it for five more weeks. Dozens of people from our neighborhood, even from across town, come here. And they've been coming here for two years regularly for food and for fellowship. And every year this event gets easier and easier to share. I will brag on everybody that worked at the um, yard sale a couple weeks ago uh, to a person to a person. There's not anybody who came for that yard sale who did not know we had food trucks coming up the next week. Y'all were awesome at it, <laughs> telling people about the events that we have. This year, we've added a huge board that puts when worship starts and how to find information on us on the website. We have sheets that we're passing out that tell people about the outreach event that's coming up next week for Kentucky Refugee Ministries. We can't say that we don't know, we don't have any opportunities. We can't say we don't know what to talk to people about. We're inviting people to be a part of it with us. And not just so they'll be here, but because we want them to know how much God loves them. How good God thinks they are. But before we do that... <laughs> We're going to practice with the easiest group ever. You're going to practice with the people who are already in, who are already following Jesus, who have already, you know, all into it. That's us. Okay? So since quite a few of you don't know each other, because you've told me, <laughs> we're going to get really, really good at introducing ourselves. And here's the deal. Everybody's going to introduce to everybody. I don't care if I have known you for years and I already know your name and your children's names and all those things. I'm going to introduce myself anyways. But we're going to do it by getting to know a little bit about each other. So the first one, and I already know where Maren's going to go stand because she told me, you're going to go by birth order. So if you were an oldest, you're going to go here. If you were a middle child, you're going to go back there. If you were a baby, you're going to go here in your family. Or if you are in the uh, extra special category of only children, you go here. <laughs> go. <laughs> when you get there, introduce yourselves, and I'll give you a question. Only children go that way. Which are you? Are you your oldest? Okay. And we're going to find out how many oldest, middles, and onlys we have. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Making you move around. All right, Josh, where are you headed? Oldest, okay. We may have a really big group of oldest. Middle, middle's back there. Middle children back there. Where are you? I'm, I'm the extra special. Oh, the extra special only children. That's great. Whoa. We have a lot of eldest. I love it. All right. All right, Bobby, you're mine. How long, oh, no, they're all chatting. How long have you been at this church? How long have you been at this church? Drexel, how long have you been at this church? How long have you been at this church? Yep.
All right. Next question. Next question. What is your favorite season of the year? Spring, summer, fall, winter. Favorite season of the year? Spring, summer, fall, winter. New group. Yeah, you move. You got to move because you're going to meet different people. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Favorite season. Is that yours? <laughs> All right, last question. Last question, and a reminder, you introduce yourselves every time you move to a new group. What is your favorite meal of the day? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert. <laughs> what? Cocktails, I didn't include cocktails. <laughs> like breakfast food. That's true.
All right, when you're done, you may return to your seats. When you've introduced yourself, you may return to your seats if everybody's introduced themselves. Mine would be breakfast. Yeah, fall, breakfast, and I'm an only child. Ah, oh, there we go. Good job, everybody. And I got to, know, I got to learn stuff from Bobby. I know, I should have. My dad also thought I should have had uh, cocktails as a category. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. Hurting cats. <laughs> That's all right. We're not in any hurry. There's nowhere else we have to be today. First off, give your all selves a hand for doing such a good job. And just one more story. I want to tell a story about a woman named Miss Cheatham uh, who grew up in Louisville. She had a family move next door to her. It was a couple, uh, and they had a very young son who would get sick a lot. But she also noticed they didn't seem to go anywhere on Sundays. So she did do one thing. We're not going to do this. She said, you really ought to get that boy to church. We're not going to do that part. <laughs> but she did do several things right. She just kept asking. And she kept asking. And then when they finally came to church, she invited them into her pew. As Harold pointed out, we all have our pews that we sit in. They made sure, she made sure that family sat with her, that they had a place with her, probably at every potluck as well. And those parents stayed in that pew for 50 more years. And that boy grew up in that church, and he was an elder in that church, and he was head of finance in that church, and all kinds of things in that church. And he brought his daughter, well, his parents brought his daughter a bunch of times to that church. And he watched her grow up in that church. And he watched her get ordained in that church. And on Father's Day, he gets to watch her preach. I know, I was going to make you cry, that's why I didn't tell you about it. <laughs> but Miss Cheatham saw a family that had moved away from their own family that maybe needed a larger loving support system. Maybe some parents who needed help raising a kid who got sick a lot. And as a kid, she didn't want him growing up not knowing that God thought he was very, very good and that he could be loved by more people than just his family. That there could be a community he could learn about the joy of generosity and what a life of faith could look like. She just didn't want anybody, in, she didn't want them in any pew. She wanted them in her pew. She wanted them at her table for potlucks. Because she was prepared to start a relationship with them. To care about them because God cares about them too. At its core, evangelism is about seeing people, seeing their needs, seeing their pain, seeing their own doubts or worries. Maybe that no one has ever told them that they are very, very good. That they still believe they never deserve more than what they have, that life is always going to be this way. They need to be told that they are needed. That they bring a unique value to this community of faith. That we are who we are because you are here. We make us us. And God thinks that is very, very good. Who else do you know who might need to hear that?
as we prepare for communion, a reminder that no matter who you are, where you come from, member, visitor, friend, uh, you're welcome at our table. I invite you to join us as we sing Mighty to Save. got back from camp as I said earlier uh, and honestly um, I could stand up here for quite a while telling you stories about Maggie because she's so interactive um, but I have one more that I'm gonna share I won't do more than that I'm just gonna do one more but uh, I wanted to share that when Maggie was asked who brought her to camp her response was Meredith, my church mother. I smiled and thought it was sweet. But then she said it again as we were ending camp. She said, you're like my church mother for the last few days because you've been taking care of me and you've been with me all this time. That's what I strive for in this community, a place where we take care of one another, 
where you feel safe with the people that you're with, where you feel loved unconditionally, whatever's going on, whatever circumstance you're in. And this table represents that for me in so many ways. So today, as you pass the tray, as you serve the person that you're sitting next to, I ask that you think about the experiences that you've had and the wonderful church mothers or church fathers that you've known and how you can be that person for someone else. As we partake in this meal together, let's remember the love and the care that we receive from each other and at this table and commit to extending that same love and care to everyone in our community and beyond. Let's create a place, let's continue creating a place where everyone feels nurtured, supported, and cherished. Let us pray. Loving God, we are here at this communion table remembering the sacrifice your son Jesus Christ made for us. We ask for your blessing on this bread and cup as we take them to be renewed in your Holy Spirit. As you sent the Holy Spirit to empower your disciples, we ask you to help us to feel the Holy Spirit's guidance in our hearts as we seek your words to share encouragement, love, and hope with those around us. We pray that everyone will come to know a relationship with you just as you desire for all of us. We pray all of this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. After laboring in the streets of Jerusalem, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God, Jesus gathered with his friends and during their meal together took bread in his hands and blessed it and broke it and said, this is the bread of life for each of you. As you eat this bread, remember me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup filled with the gifts of the vine, and in his blessing, he reminded them of this new covenant and said, whenever you drink this, remember me. Just as Jesus gathered, we gather at this table where we believe that all are welcome, no matter where you are on life's journey. I invite you to take the bread as it is passed and hold the cup so that we can take it together as a symbol of our unity. All are welcome.
As we go to God in prayer this morning, uh, I want to let you know that if you have a prayer concern or you would like to talk with someone, Sharon was, is here and uh, she'll stay after church um, to pray with you or talk with you if you need that. If you're worshiping online and uh, you would like someone to talk with, David, our moderator, can get you in touch with someone. And I also want to give a shout out to David. He's uh, moderating today with COVID and his wife has COVID, so I want to remember them in prayer as well. Please pray with me. Loving God, on this Father's Day, we give thanks for fathers everywhere who embrace the sacred calling to nurture, protect, and guide the children entrusted to their care. We pray for new fathers, that they may model patience, wisdom, and unconditional love. Give them strength and endurance for the many joys and challenges ahead. We pray for single fathers, who must shoulder alone the daily task of parenting. Grant them perseverance, courage, and the support of caring communities. We pray for fathers who have lost a child, whether through death, separation, or estrangement. Comfort them in their grief and sustain them through life's valleys of sorrow. We pray for fathers who did not have role models of faithful parenting. Show them how to break cycles of harm and create new legacies of love. We pray for fathers in conflict zones or prisons separated from their children by circumstances beyond their control. Reunite them with their families and restore what has been broken. We pray for fathers of every ethnicity and culture that our diversity may be celebrated as an expression of your creative majesty. We pray for fathers who are immigrants or refugees seeking safety and opportunity to build better lives for their children. Protect them and help them found, find welcoming communities. We pray for fathers who grieve over children lost of violence, addiction, or illness. Embrace them in your healing love and renew their hope. We pray for fathers of children with special needs, that they may embody the patience and compassion of Christ. We pray for fathers who have been absent, abusive, or emotionally distant from their children. Heal broken bonds and soften hardened hearts. We pray for those grieving the loss of their fathers, whether recently or long ago. Comfort them in their sadness and sustain their treasured memories. Let us praise those men who have fathered us in their role as mentors and guides, imparting wisdom, modeling virtue, and nurturing our growth. We give thanks for teachers, coaches, church leaders, and elders whose investment has enriched our lives and shaped us for the good. We honor the men who step forward as father figures when our biological fathers were absent or unable to fill that role. Their selfless love has left an indelible mark. Bless these spiritual fathers, Lord, for their profound influence. May they find great joy in witnessing the positive impact of their nurturing presence. Holy God, you are the source of life and the model of all loving parents and mentors. Bless these fathers and all who nurture and care for your children. Uphold them through times of struggle and rejoice with them in seasons of joy. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to gather all my papers, <laughs> make sure I have all the things. So this is the time of invitation where if you have found a home here at First Christian Church and want to become a member, you can come forward. Or if you have heard the call of Jesus on your heart and you want to make Jesus the story of your life and make your confession of faith for the first time, you are welcome to come forward as we sing. But as often as I'm up here doing the invitation, I remind you that all of us are called every week. Jesus is always inviting us. But it also makes me think, Will you be the Miss Cheatham for someone else? Or in this place, will you be the Charlotte Tharp of this place who will invite the next family that will make us us, that will be a unique part of this community that helps us build the kingdom together? With that, will you please stand for our song of invitation?
Chad and I worked together at the Jeffersonville Church for 10, many years, 10 years, a lot, a bunch, a whole bunch of them. Uh, So a couple of announcements before I offer you your blessing. Obviously, the food trucks are this Wednesday, and we are going to have a bunch of wonderful guests that we want to welcome to this place. Plus, it's just delicious, and we've covered your Wednesday meal for you, so why wouldn't you join us? Um, Also, because Diane asked for them, we out in the narthex, we have a few, there are people you want to invite and you want to hand them a piece of paper that tells them all the food trucks and when they are, they're sitting out there. So you ask and you shall receive. Uh, so you're welcome to pick those up, but also a reminder next week, right, is next week is our uh, Kentucky Refugee Ministry. It's an outreach. Uh, it's tour. We get to help put some of our uh, backpacks together. Um, we want to try and have as many of us there to learn about it because then we can talk good news about that as well. So those are the two announcements for this week. May you go from this place hearing deeply, deeply in your core, God's voice say, you are very good. Now go tell everyone you know that they are very good too. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Stout, you are the Lord. 